David Toby. I'm Product Technology Manager for the Spider line of products at Data Color, and I'm here sitting in front of a roaring fire with a glass of eggnog with my good friend David Saffer, who's actually three time zones away in California. Good to see you, David. Hi, everybody. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about some products that you or some other photographer you know might want. So whether you choose to use this list for your own purchases or to put it on the fridge for uh, others to buy for you, you may find one or more items in this uh, hour that, that are something that will be valuable to you for your holiday shopping one way or the other. So David and I are going to take turns uh, describing various products that for the most part, one or the other of us owns or has used, and uh, there may be some insights in there that will be valuable to you. At the end of the event, we'll make a PDF file of this presentation to put on our website, as well as putting up the, uh, the video once that's done. Now, the video, of course, will include all our commentary, which you might be interested in later, but the PDF will just be the, the uh, slides that you're going to see now, which will be the easy way for you to get the URLs and the names of any products that interested you, but that you didn't quite catch the necessary information during the presentation. Now, at the end of the event, we'll have a, a drawing, a raffle for a spider, and we will also have a discount announcement for any of the products that uh, we might have snuck in here that are data color products. And uh, so you can stay tuned for that. We're not going to be doing much in the way of chat Q&A here since much of what we're talking about are not data color products. So uh, mostly since we'll both be uh, attending to speaking, we're not going to be attending too much to, uh, to responding to, to chat questions. So uh, David, you're running the slideshow. I'll let you uh, push the button and uh, get us started. Well, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, this should be a fun session. We're going to go through some ideas that we've uh, put together that hopefully will help you uh, stuff some of those stockings and find some gifts for others or maybe even for yourself. Um, by the way, I'm a photographer and fine art printmaker, and as David mentioned, I live uh, three time zones away from him. I'm out in Los Angeles, California. Well, I have you beat today, David, because it's snowing here in Maine. Uh, you don't want to know what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> So starting with the stocking stuffers, um, you know, normally I think of Holga as a camera or a filter, et cetera, et cetera, and I stumbled across this Holga lens kit, and they have one for Nikon and one for Canon, and I thought, now that's a cool idea. If you want to experiment with a Holga, this is the kit for you. The thing I liked about this is it was for Canon and Nikon, it had all of the different filters uh, that one could possibly imagine. Uh, plus a couple of lenses, uh, and at $89, a great deal. Um, next slide, please. Well, this is, should be familiar to any of you who are data color users. The ultimate data color stocking stuffer is the Spider Cube. One of the beauties of buying it for somebody is you don't have to worry about whether they already have one because you can never have too many of these. They're like salt peanuts. You should have one in every camera case and in your vest and in your studio. So. An extra spider cube is always a good thing to have. Now this is this is a fun one. The lens pen company also makes a sensor pen. So the lens pen is particularly good for getting those components of your lens that you can't really reach. Those in some lenses, the back glass is way inside, and when you get dirt up in there, it's difficult to get at. The sensor pen uh, is very good for cleaning sensors, but the process is not like a wet clean. It, it, uh, it eliminates some of the dust, and, and some of it, it kind of sweeps to the edges. So it kind of builds up around the edges, and eventually you reach the point where you, you decide to either do a wet clean yourself or send it out. But in the meantime, on site, when there's a big black thing on your sensor, and you're trying to shoot, having a sensor pen with you is a great solution. Now, I do have to mention the Marley tram on the right. This is uh, a little uh, children's tram that travels the inner city loop in Zurich, Switzerland during the holidays, and that is uh, their Father Christmas there who's driving, and people put their little children on this tram 
and let them go around the city, something no one in America would ever dream of doing. And in the back, there are angels taking care of the kids and reading stories to them. It's quite sweet. Their um, their St. Nicholas does not have anything to do with Christmas, per se. St. Nicholas's Day is, I believe, December 4th, someday early in the month, and that's when their children get stockings. So I guess we can move on here. Okay, for all of those, you know, all of you who uh, always wanted to be on iSpy, um, this is the uh, lens accessory for you. This has a mirror inside it and a porthole on the side, so you can appear to be taking pictures of things that are in front of you, but actually be taking pictures of things to your left or right. And so uh, those of you who want to walk around Times Square and make strange photographs, this is the toy for you, $19. Next slide, please. Now, this is really Right Stuff, which is one of my favorite companies, and we've only got one item on here uh, that we specify, which is the L mounting plate. And I want to point out that the, the real advantage of this is, is actually not convenience, per se, because, uh, of course, you can turn the camera on its side and attach it to your, uh, your ball head mount without having to flip the ball to the left or the right. But because you don't have to flip the ball to the left or the right, the center of gravity of the camera is over the center of axis of the tripod. That means less camera shake, uh, sharper pictures, and a little bit more safety as well. So it's really worth having, even though they seem that they're expensive, every camera I own has one of these on it. Of course, uh, really right stuff makes fantastic products at a high price. This is about as affordable as their products get because everything is hand machined right there in California by someone who used to be an aircraft machinist. Yeah, he's quite the guy. Um, some of us shoot tethered. There's a kit from Tether Tools. Uh, it has several items in it, um, cables, a light for your laptop um, keyboard. Let's say you're in a dark studio and you can't see your keyboard. Um, there are what's called stoppers, which keep, if someone pulls on the cord, the tethering cord, it will not pull your camera over, at least not usually, and it won't pull the plug out of the camera, which can be a real problem with software. Um, the cables also have a plug that attaches it firmly to the laptop. So at the price, to have everything that you need to shoot tethered is, uh, is a pretty good deal. I know people who shoot tethered regularly whose actual camera stance is based on having one of their fingers holding the L plug of the tethered cable into their camera at all times. So they've literally developed a stance that involves keeping the cable connected. So when I look at a product like this, I think, wow, I would not have to learn to keep my finger at all times over that plug if I had some other tool that did that for me. Yeah, when the plug comes uh, detached, there are some software packages that just stop working and force you to restart the computer, so it's not such a bad thing. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, David, you want to tell yeah, This is a great one. Any of you who use Wacom tablets, this is just uh, amazing. I'll let David talk about it, but think about the price here. This is just an incredible price. Go ahead, David. Well, I like the Wacom tablets because I do a lot of compositing and, and um, masking and things like that. And so having a pen tablet next to the mouse is always a good idea. It's a good productivity tool. Um, this one's made to be portable, obviously. But the other advantage it has is if you want to try a pen tablet, and not everybody's convinced that it's the right thing for them, if you want to try a pen tablet at $70, you can't really go wrong. Um, the, the Big Daddy tablets cost anywhere from 300 on up, and that's a pretty big investment for something you might not be sure about. So the Bamboo, um, they have one that's called the Splash and one that's called the Capture, and they have slightly different features. At $70 is a great deal. Next slide, please. Ah, reflectors. This is a 5-in-1, so it has a spring-loaded diffuser inside it, so there's a semi- uh, sort of a translucent piece of nylon inside that you can use, for example, to shade a portrait subject that's in direct light. Uh, it also becomes the backbone of um, basically a shade. Inside the shade, which is reversible, are gold and silver panels. So this is a very, very versatile reflector. Um, Westcott makes some really nice lighting equipment, too. Uh, but this is a very, very versatile reflector. comes in several sizes and 
the prices for each size are really quite reasonable. Now the one thing that this reflector doesn't do is, is twist figure eight style into a third of its original size for, for travel, correct? No, it does. It just the, the big ah. one is kind of big one you've got to practice a little bit with it or it'll <laughs> snap, snap your head right off. But um, <laughs> they get away from you, they bounce around. But if you if you just hold it out, turn one hand in the opposite direction and then twist and bring them towards the center of your body, it'll fold up just fine. Because that's the that's the key to being able to carry a reflector is having it not be a permanently full size reflector. Yes, practice at home. <laughs> Uh, I'm the one that put these in here. These are relatively new from Pocket Wizard, and we all think of Pocket Wizard as radio-controlled um, strobe um, activators, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are actually made for, um, they make them for Nikon and for Canon, and they're actually for the speed lights that are made for each one of those cameras, and, get this, they communicate, and, and all, both those speed lights, the Canon and the Nikon, communicate via infrared, which means it doesn't work around corners, it doesn't work past a certain distance. These are radio driven, and they also integrate with the TTL exposure controls on each camera. So you can use a multitude of speed lights, which is one of the things a lot of people are getting into, to light a scene instead of a bunch of big lights. And the TTL exposure uh, feature will work for all of those lights, and you'll get apparently get a really incredible result from this. I'm waiting to get a pair of these to try it. Um, they're not cheap. They're $200 a piece, but if you think of the trade-off, if you had a half dozen speed lights versus, versus say, a half dozen um, power pack driven lights, the amount of weight you're carrying around um, is very significant. You could put everything you needed in a small duffel bag if you had these and light a set and be perfectly happy with the results. Well, let me start here. Um, Photoshop masking and compositing, the second edition has just come out. I'm in the process of reading it as we speak. And uh, while Katrin Eisman is the top name on this, uh, Sean Dugan is one of our new Friend with Visions experts. His, uh, his bio will come up on the Spider blog in the next few days. And so we're very happy to welcome Sean Dugan on board and to, uh, to have such a uh, great author and writer writing stuff for the Spider Blog with us. So um, this is the thing that you really need Photoshop for these days is not all the things we used to use it for that Lightroom does now. It's the stuff that Lightroom doesn't do, and that really has to do with layers and selections and masking and compositing. So this is the book about the thing that Photoshop is still being used for exclusively, Took and was a good out of my choice. Mouth, David. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then I'll let you do the next book. No, 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 I just meant this is the book. I have it sitting here on my desk, and although it's very dense, it definitely has all the things that one needs as a complement to the other Adobe software products. Um, Martin Evening is one of my favorite authors for Adobe Photoshop. Um, I give him credit for helping me learn most of what I know about Photoshop. It's from Focal Press. Um, the other book, um, was from Peach Pit. They're both uh, the pr two of the premier, excuse me, they are two of the premier publishers in the photographic world. And Martin, you'll find Martin Evening's explanations to be clear and actionable. If you finish a chapter with him, you'll know what to do. That's all I have to say about that. He's a great guy, too. Well, let's go on to the light scoop. I want to hear David talk about the light scoop. Well, the light scoop is, is a widget. Um, I think it fills a gap between, say, putting a, a, a strobe or a flash on camera and um, getting better results with some of the pop-up flashiness that you see on the mid-range DSLRs. It's a diffuser that slips right over that pop-up flash. Uh, it won't get you a lot of range. In fact, it will probably reduce the range of that flash a little bit. The diffuser takes up some of the light. But when you're in that sort of middle zone where you want to take a quick shot, you don't want to necessarily blow them away with a big on-camera um, strobe, um, this could just be the ticket. Besides, it's small and it has a small price and it's something that anybody, just be sure the photographer you're buying this for has a camera that has a pop-up flash because some of the high-end DSLRs avoid that. 
So uh, as long as they've got a pop-up flash on their camera, they, there's no way that they can't consider this a good thing to have in their kit. There you go. Next, Next slide, please. You want to go for this, David? Well, I'm going to let you do this one because I'm going to talk about other alternatives to this later. Okay. There's a number of iPod, iPhone tripod mounts. This one will fit the iPhone 4, 4S, and 5, and uh, it's relatively inexpensive. It does have a couple of shortcomings in that um, you can't really tilt things very far with this. It pretty much has to be um, straight up and straight down, but it does um, work on a monopod. It works on a tripod, and it does give you a nice firm support for, say, video or for still photographs. Next slide, now, please. That was that was a great one. If you take your iPhone and put it on a tripod, does that make it into an iPod? No. <laughs> <laughs> this one should look familiar to, to the data color uh, fans out there. Of course, um, if you don't have or you know someone who does not have a spider checker, um, this is something that can be used with any camera. What you have to be sure is that the person you're buying it for has or uses Lightroom or Photoshop or ACR with that or Hasselblad Focus because those are supported applications. So while there are other things you could do with this target, particularly in video, you don't need any software with it at all. It's used a lot in video for white balance and exposure. But uh, for uh, the color side of the target, we're talking about people who use Lightroom or Photoshop and you just want to check that before you get them a, a checker so that it will be uh, fully uh, flexible with their with their software. And if they aren't using Lightroom yet, given the price drops that have occurred with it lately, and in fact the sales that are going on right now with it, then they you, you they should be using Lightroom because it's a, an incredible deal and, and very much the standard place to have your entire photo library these days. Next. Ah, this is the GTEC external drive. You want to talk about this a little bit, and then I will, or vice versa? Well, let me let me talk in ge more general terms. There are two sizes of drives: the ones you actually carry around, portable drives, and the ones you don't, the larger ones like this. And then there are really uh, there's one other major consideration for drives, which is the format that it communicates by. So a USB 2 drive is pretty cheap right now because they're selling them out, but it's also incredibly slow to load stuff to. So if you only have to do it once, it doesn't matter. If you're going to move stuff back and forth a lot, it does. USB 3 is much more flexible and much better for moving a lot of stuff. And of course, Thunderbolt is the ultimate drive for moving things quickly. However, unless you're doing video, you probably don't need that speed and the, and the convenience of being able to plug into any device that has a USB port with the USB 3 drive is probably the choice. So I'll let you speak specifically about this drive now that I've kind of set the parameters. Um, well, the thing about GTEC is that they have a number of drives. As you said, some of them are made more portable than others. Um, I actually use the size drive if I'm going to be doing some serious location work, et cetera, because it's self-cooling. It's not laying flat on a surface, and so they tend to last longer if they're up off the table or the floor or wherever you've got them. Um, there's different connecting ports depending on which model and when it was made. Um, the external, the two terabyte 7200 RPM drive, if memory serves, does have USB 3. Um, and it has FireWire 800, but it does not have Thunderbolt. One of the reasons I like this drive for Photoshop work is I use it as a scratch drive because it's running at 7200 RPM. So if you've got it hooked up with a decent interface, um, you should get some decent, but not, you know, set your hair on fire speed out of it. It will certainly uh, help the speed of your 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 work with some of your larger Photoshop files. Well, so one one out. other one other factor I'd mentioned there and forgot to mention the first time too is is what they call composite drives now. Things like oh, yeah. um, Apple now has a drive which has a small solid state drive attached to a large disk, so it's much less expensive than a full-size solid-state drive, but it gives you serious speed increases for the things that it keeps on the solid-state component. So that's another thing to consider when looking at drives these days, is the fusion yep. drive and that type of system. And I'll add one last thing, is that when you do go and look at the drive, um, take a look and see if the drive is powered via the connector cable or it needs a separate power supply. 
Um, I tend to stay away from portable drives that need a separate power supply. It's too much to carry around. Um, a lot of them are powered by the connecting cable, so just take a look at it and look at the box before you put down your money. So our next product here is familiar again to data color users. Uh, anybody that doesn't have a spider, I mean that's just a basic. You got to have monitor calibration. There's three levels of it. Uh, you can get somebody a spider for Christmas that's under a hundred dollars, depending on what you buy and where you buy it. So while Elite is the ultimate spider product, um, there are certainly other considerations. Many people are very very happy with the Spider 4 Pro. I wouldn't necessarily suggest going out and getting an Express at cut rate pricing for people because it doesn't have the upgradeability uh, to, to the enhanced feature sets that you get with Pro and Elite. So without banging our data color drum too loudly here, we do have to put uh, Spider 4 in as the, the most obvious thing you could give a photographer for Christmas if he doesn't already own one. Next. Ah, uh, yes. I put this one in. Um, it's a, If you do any outdoor work, um, a headlamp, particularly one that doesn't actually have the strap that goes over the top because they're kind of annoying, um, this kind of headlamp is a godsend. If you get caught out after dark or you just have to walk in very early before dawn, having a headlamp is a real plus on the safety side. It keeps both hands free. You're not carrying a flashlight. Um, these are very sophisticated devices. They typically have two levels of intensity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the batteries last almost forever because they're they're LED light sources. So if you don't have something like this in your camera bag and you do shoot outdoors or on you know places like that, then I suggest that you get one and tuck it away. Yeah, that's one thing that fishermen and photographers have in common is they always want to be on site at dusk or at dawn, which means that one trip or the other is in the dark. Yeah. So I really, really, I use mine uh, on almost every trip and I'm grateful to have it. It's uh, much easier to see where you're going. I often find myself using them inside, even in studio situations. Yeah. Uh, this is a continuous lighting kit. This is about as basic as it gets. The nice thing is, is that it has light stands and a couple of umbrellas and a case. It's not the best or the brightest. Um, it's a starter kit, which one can add to, of course. It's continuous lighting, so it's suitable for video, for example. The bulbs are daylight balanced. Um, it's a starting point, something for you to think about. Cowboy Studio seems to be an up and coming, up and coming shop as far as reasonably priced and technologically appropriate gear and I encourage you to go and take a look at their website. Yeah, there are three real virtues to this kit. One is it is expandable. You don't necessarily stop using the components as you add stuff. The second is it does have a case so you can carry it. And the third is look at the price. I mean you can't buy a bulb for some sets for the price that you're getting this entire kit for. Yeah. Next. Okay, now we're getting into LED lighting, and this gets a little more interesting. This stuff tends to cost more, and it tends to put out less light for the same price, but it has certain other virtues that mean eventually you're likely to end up owning LED lighting, even if you start out with fluorescent lighting. And as long as they're both daylight balanced, you may very well do what I often do, which is mix the two. And all that matters, all, all that matters on a site is what lighting you've got with you that you can use together. And uh, I think David can tell you a little bit about the one on the left and the unique situation that's in right now. Uh, the one on the left is made by, <clears throat> excuse me, is made by ProMaster. It's rechargeable, which is great, and the charge lasts a long time. It's also in, it has a variable um, uh, intensity um, switch on the back, so you can ramp it up or down as you see fit. Um, the price right now is quite low because they're being phased out, this particular model. And so there's some on Amazon, there are some in the camera stores, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can actually get them for as low as $50 if you hunt around, but I wouldn't wait too long because my guess is by Christmas they'll all be gone. Now, and I, I really didn't address the pricing that we're listing here. We're talking about prices we've found or that are listed as kind of the street price for these products. They're assumed to be in U.S. dollars and we're making you no guarantees you can get it for this. On the other hand, in many cases you could get it for less. If you look around, you have a special 
in for getting stuff. So these prices are just to give you a sense of the ballpark. Next. Ah, uh, yes. Now, recording audio is not part of still photography, so this really is a video accessory. And what we're looking at here is a microphone that has three or four particular characteristics. One is it's stereo, so it takes advantage of the stereo capability that the more recent DSLR cameras have. The second is it has a windsock for outside use. The third is it fits on the hot shoe on your camera so that this thing can be mounted on your camera while you're shooting. And of course it has, as we joke about it, the right plug on the other end. It's not just any plug, the right plug on the other end of the cable to plug into the uh, audio of your camera. So with those components at a reasonable price, we're talking about a, a microphone Oh, of the, the kind that makes you sound like, uh, you know, a good radio announcer with that nice, smooth, deep, booming voice. <laughs> kind of microphones that you don't, don't get for $39. By the way, this is a directional microphone. Yeah, the advantage of directional is, is, of course, key for when you're trying to aim at something and get the sound that's coming from there rather than, you know, all the ambient sound that's coming from behind you. Next, Next. please. Oh, this one's mine. I, I stuck this in here. Um, I wear reading glasses, and I do not wear any other kind of glasses. Therefore, I have this dilemma when I'm on site that I'm forever wanting to see the preview on the back of my camera. And to do that, I put my glasses on. And then to shoot, I take my glasses off. Now, repeat that 50 times in an hour, and sooner or later, you lose your glasses. So the, there are several advantages to using a loop with your, your camera. One is you get a, a larger, clearer, easier to recognize preview on the back of the camera. Another is you shut out ambient light. If you try to look at the, at the LCD screen in the back of your camera in bright daylight, it's almost impossible to see, whereas a loop like this closes off the daylight and allows you to see that. But my very favorite factor is there's a diopter adjustment ring on this, which allows you to set it up for your eye and your needs, which means when somebody else looks through it, it doesn't work. So Photographers who use these seriously don't carry one of them. They actually carry two, one for them and one for the other guy because <laughs> you don't want to be swapping this around. Vincent Versace, when he does his what's in my bag routine, he pulls out two, two of these Hoodman loops, and the answer is one goes around my neck and nobody gets that one but me, and the other one's for whoever I'm dealing with who needs to also be able to see what's on my camera. Good idea. Next. Now, if you're really brave, this is a suction cup based device, the MonsterPod camera mount. Uh, you can slap a camera on the side of your car if you want to. <laughs> I don't know if I would do it, particularly in LA, but there you have it. Um, it's really intended to be mounted on any smooth surface. It's got a little bit of weight to it and has a, you know, a threaded mount, as you see there, and the price is right. Yeah, I've, I've used these on glass surfaces and I'm quite comfortable putting my backup body and you'll notice what you're probably going to want here is that L bracket because you're going to want your camera perpendicular and so this plus the L bracket plus your DSLR camera mounted onto the side window of a car mm -hmm. can make for a really convincing piece of video. Now the biggest concern there is not your camera falling off, it is getting this suction cup off the glass without breaking your car window. So that's why there's a tab on it for breaking the suction. Ah. Next. Now I'll just go, go back to that other one. What a lot of people oh, do sure. when, they're, when they're mounting that thing at a, at a height above ground is they take one of the uh, loops on the camera that's normally used for a camera strap and they tether the camera to something so that if the darn thing pops off the camera doesn't go on the ground. It might get banged around a little bit, but it won't break it. So there's a little a little tip for you. Yeah, tethering and gaffing is a whole subject unto itself. And of course, the interesting thing about this particular, what I'm going to call a sandbag mount, is it requires no tethering or gaffing. All the things you usually do to a camera aren't done here. Anybody who's ever shot a gun using a sandbag mount on a picnic table knows just how amazingly convenient a sandbag can be as, as a mount. And this is the exact same concept for cameras. Yeah, these are great. You can actually even use this for any number of things. It's sort of like a, uh, I guess you could say in a way it can be a substitute for a tripod because you can put the camera down and 
Um, for example, if you want to shoot wildlife and aim it at a particular spot and then back off with your remote and take pictures. And uh, it's very low pro profile, it's hard to see, um, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, it's very convenient for taking a, a, a steady shot um, when a tripod just isn't practical or allowed. So. But it also is great for weight, either for the base of something that you're worried about or for hanging from your tripod. Any place that you need a weight, this is uh, useful there as well. You betcha. Next. Uh, the Tenba rain cover. Now, this rain cover is, you know, there's a lot of companies that make rain covers. Um, rain covers can be very, very helpful, of course, if you're out in the weather. Uh, particularly if you have a long lens and particularly if it's a zoom, there's a lot of moving parts and places for water to get inside the mechanism and I strongly suggest that if you do find yourself out in the weather, and this is certainly the time of year for it, that you have some kind of rain cover in your, in your camera bag. Um, now one little tip that, um, that might help if you're standing there waiting for the light and you do want to keep the rain out of the end of the lens. One of those little plastic shower caps does the job real well, and you can just pop it off when you're ready to shoot. So you mean I should have been picking up the plastic shower caps at my hotel rooms all these years? Oh, I have hundreds. I'll see <laughs> <laughs> well, the next slide has to do with lens babies, which are perhaps the, the funnest gift you can give to a photographer. Um, if you haven't had a lens baby, you haven't had as much fun with your camera as you can have. So <laughs> the beauty of it is that they range in price, and the cheaper lens babies are not necessarily inferior. In fact, they're more creative in many ways than the more expensive ones. Uh, the original lens baby kind of looked like a piece of vacuum cleaner hose with a plastic lens stuck in the end, because that's <laughs> kind of what it was. And the the low-end lens babies today still offer you that capability to both push and pull and to distort to the side, and it actually gives you a more flexible option of everything from double axis distortion to very close up macros that you don't get with the kind of uh, single pivot fixed lens babies that you see in this photograph. That, that's a much cooler looking lens, but it does fewer things than the dangly one. So uh, having a lens baby on the correct mount for your camera type uh, gives you just a creative option that that you don't have if you have nothing except uh, what I'm going to call serious lenses. Ah, here we go. The trick with the Olo clip. This is a great lens for, for photography with your iPhone. And it has three lenses in it. It has a wide angle, and then a wider angle, which is a true fisheye, and then it has a macro. And you flip it over to access the second lens, and then you, you twist one lens off to access the third lens. Now the limitations of this are that it's all going wider, none of it's going narrower, and that you have to be careful about the stray part when you're using it for macro, and that it only does one macro distance, about an inch and a half, and you're not going to do a three inch or a six inch macro, so it's a little inflexible in that respect. But the other thing to warn you about is that this friction fits onto your iPhone, which means it needs to be built specifically for the iPhone model. So the one you're seeing here would be the iPhone 4 and 4S model. I own that model. If I upgrade my phone, I'm out of luck because it won't fit onto my iPhone 5 unless I make a careful shim to take up the extra thickness in it. So there is now an iPhone 5 version of this, but any, any lens that works with this methodology is specific to a specific uh, thickness of phone. And I'm not even sure that the camera placement's identical with the iPhone 5. So they may actually have had to redesign the, uh, the uh, size and shape of this as well as the thickness. Next. I've, I've used these types of lenses, in other words, telescopic extension lenses that have their own cases with iPhones as well, not this particular make. Uh, the one I had was an 8X lens with a little low-cost plastic case. I had that case on my iPhone for two years. It actually lasted longer than some of the decorative cases I bought. But the 8X plastic lens was not high quality, and the results, while they were highly magnified, were not great shots. So this is a great compromise because this is a serious lens here. And at 2X, it gets you closer, but it's not a, you know, a heavy telephoto. So um, you can buy this 
uh, in wide angle fisheye or 2x, if you get them all, you get a serious set of optics. And unlike the one you saw on the previous page on the OLA clip, this offers you uh, a telephoto capability instead of just wide and fisheye capabilities. So that's a more expensive but more broad ranged option. Next. Uh, the Gorilla Pods. Uh, I think we all know about these. What's interesting is, is they're coming up with some models that are um, really almost purpose built for specific cameras. So if you look at this one, uh, this little point and shoot is as steady as can be. And it's very reasonably priced. Um, the, the, the Gorilla Pod is more expensive, um, takes up more room. This folds up into an incredibly small space and yet you can put a reasonably sized camera on it and for twenty dollars you could hardly beat it. Yeah, the uh, beauty of this is that all, all three legs pivot to be adjacent to each other and flat against the bottom of the camera so it really makes for a very compact almost non-existent tripod on the bottom of your camera when it's folded up. Now you know what us data color people do with this. We do not put cameras on this. We put spider cubes on this. This is the <laughs> ultimate stand for a spider cube. Next. Now this is the same thing. It's That's the very same tripod you just saw with a camera phone adapter on the top. And the beauty of this adapter is it works on different phones with and without cases, which is the, the, the what I told you I'd be talking about a more fe flexible solution later. And that's what I love here is that you can attach this to virtually any smartphone. Now do you really need to put your smartphone on a stand to take pictures? Not really. Do you really need to put it on a stand to shoot video? Absolutely. So this is really a uh, way of making your iPhone video uh, look more professional and less shaky by having, having some kind of stand to uh, do it with. Besides, if you're going to do things with both your hands and video yourself, like you know the box opening videos, then you've got to have a third hand, and this is that third hand. You could also, couldn't, could you also use this for a video call? If you're using your iPhone for anything else, or if you're using anything else that will fit in this stand, yes, there are a range of things you could do on a serious production set with this stand as well. Yeah. Cool. Including uh, using your iPhone as a uh, teleprompter. So this is a serious monopod. Uh, this is not a low-cost item, but since there's far less um, mechanical head in a monopod than in a tripod, and since there's only one leg, you can afford to get a, a high-quality one. So if your goal is, is one leg instead of three with very little mechanism on it, <laughs> then for 150 bucks you're talking about a very high-quality uh, monopod here, which doubles as any number of things from a walking staff on down through to a you know, you, people use these for all sorts of things. Anything that mounts onto a standard thread will go on here, including, I hate to bang that drum again, a spider cube. Yeah, I like monopods quite a bit. There's places that won't let you use a tripod, but they'll let you use a monopod. And if you practice a little bit and you use, say, a wall, for another a wall for support and things like that, you can get almost the same stability and the access to an area with a monopod that you could never get with a tripod. So it's really worth having one of these. And a monopod is back. its not just a poor man's tripod. It's also, as David said, allows you to shoot in places you couldn't otherwise. It's a better tool for some kinds of video shooting than a photographer's tripod. Because if you have a ball head tripod, that's just not made for panning. If you have a monopod, you can brace that against something and pivot quite nicely and actually end up with better footage from that monopod than you would from uh, many tripods. Next. Uh, this is mine. I put this in here. This is, I got to describe it as a cheap carbon tripod. This is, this is not a brand name. It's Adorama that puts this on the market to have the most affordable tripod in its class. And it is carbon, so it's lightweight, but Here's the deal. I believe in Steve Still's theory of love the one you're with. The, the best tripod is not the best tripod I own. It's the best tripod I have with me. And this is the tripod I have with me. The reason being, not only will it fit in my carry-on bag, it will fit in my carry-on bag without taking half of it up. And it will even fit in my briefcase. 
I've a, a arrived at, at shoots where they assumed I didn't have a tripod with me because I walked in with nothing but a small camera bag and this of course was in that camera bag. So it, the beauty of it is it's small, it's light, and you have it when you need it. It is not as stiff, it is not as rigid as the big tripod. And the way they have it set up in this photo is actually wrong. They've extended the smallest section of the leg at the bottom and then left the mid sections unextended. You do exactly the opposite. You start at the top and you, you extend from there down and you almost never extend that bottom section because it's the smallest diameter and the, uh, the least rigid. So under most circumstances I only extend three out of these four sections and I keep the, the bottom section unextended, which means that the tripod's not as high or as convenient, but it's much more rigid. So this is a, a very good make-do tripod at a very low price that will allow you to do interior shots in dark churches and cathedrals and things that you just can't do without a tripod. I believe the next slide will show you a head that matches this. This is the head I have on that tripod. Not an expensive head, but it's a decent ball head and it's how shall I say this? It's stiff enough for a tripod that's no stiffer than the one in the previous slide. And you'll notice that if you put the two prices together, you get exactly $200, which is a pretty reasonable, I mean, I don't know a photographer who wouldn't be thrilled to get a convenient travel tripod in carbon fiber with a ball head on it for Christmas. And for $200, that's uh, an amazingly good deal. They'll assume you spent more. Next. Ah, the filters. You know, there's a there's always the issue of protecting the front of your lens. So a you know, a clear filter is something that you should have to protect your lenses. And then there's also a number of other types of lenses. You have circular uh, lens filters. You have circular polarizers. You actually obviously have filter lenses. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of graduated density filters here. So I don't think I have to explain the purpose of all of these to a group like this, but these are really nice stocking stuffers. They're generally not that expensive, particularly if uh, in a lot of camera stores, if you go to the back table, there's boxes and boxes of these that are on sale that haven't moved in a while. So this is one gift idea that uh, can keep you in your budget and still make the photographer uh, on your gift list happy. Now, my point of view on this is it's like not going shopping for your spouse until you know the various sizes of various clothes and footgear that your spouse wears. Same deal here. Make a note of the lens end sizes, how many millimeters the threads on the end of their lenses are uh, before you go shopping for them so you'll know what filters will fit which lenses. Yeah, the thread size is, is generally measured in millimeters. Next slide, Next. please. Ah, uh, the well, Gora bag. We went over the top here. I'll let you start on this one, David. Well, David and I have each um, done a review. David's done um, the 26L and I've done the 32L. They're different sizes. Um, these are arguably a couple of the best camera bags around um, by virtue of both design and materials. Uh, I think that when I took mine out of the box, I said to myself, something like this is really really light and given the amount of gear that you can carry in it and the amount of protection that it offers it's probably about half the weight of anything else that I have uh, in my storeroom. It also has in a very ingenious um, compartment design which David will talk about in a minute. One of my favorite things is that you can see in the picture on the left that the, the back flap um, looks smooth but if you unzip that the Backpack straps can be deployed, and they're among the best backpack straps around. They have very, very good ergonomic designs. Um, there's a chest strap and a weight-bearing um, padded waist strap, which are both indispensable if you're doing any kind of walking over rough ground. So all in all, this is probably at the, uh, my favorite camera bag, and I encourage you to take a look at it. And David, if you want to add some more details, please do. Well, we've exceeded the stocking stuffer range without question with this bag, but if you want to make a photographer, a travel photographer happy, this is the ultimate thing to put your all your gear in for traveling. Uh, the, the item that David wanted me to mention, I believe, was the, the butterfly opening of this. If you look at the photo on the right, 
that's Velcro on that middle uh, partition. And if you close this case, it then is secure end-to-end -end with that, and you can unzip just one side or the other, one half, and, and pivot the top up by halves, so you end up with a uh, butterfly opening system, which allows you to open just half the case at a time. And it's much more secure and much more weatherproof to get things out of the case that way than to open the entire top up, as you see here. So this is an ingenious design for access, and it's an ingenious design for carrying, and it fits into an overhead compartment even on a regional jet. So uh, while David and I have not had the time to use these packs on a lot of our own trips, we're convinced this is going to be a favorite pack of ours over time. Next. Okay, you know what I'm going to say here. This mm -hmm. is a an 8 inch extension handle. Now, do you think I put a camera on this thing? Absolutely not. On the side of my butterfly pack from the last screen, what you would see is this telescope down to just be the handle with a spider cube on it, perpendicular the same way this camera is on it perpendicularly. I whip this out of my pack, I extend it, I hold it out in front, and I take a shot, and that gives me all my exposure and color temperature information for the scene. And I may have used that information for assisting with my camera settings. And it takes me less than a minute to pull this out, extend it, shoot it, and put it back. And it's secure when it's in there. So this is an excellent extension arm for the spider cube. If you use a cube seriously, you should have one of these low-cost extenders. So the Christmas gift here would consist of one of these extenders and a cube preferably already mount, on, mounted on it so people would understand what it was for, and they make a perfect pair. Next. They do, they do make a perfect pair. Can we go back just for a second? I just wanted to mention the camera is actually, in my opinion, is facing the wrong way. If you want to get, <laughs> if you want to get some unusual shots or shoot above a crowd, this is an interesting setup. If you turn the camera around and you set it on self-timer and you hold the camera up, you might see some surprising things. So next slide, please. These are memory cards. We all know what they are. They are um, companies. Um, Hoodman also, we didn't put their name on here, but Hoodman is a company that supplies some really good memory cards. And of course, you've got SanDisk and, uh, and Lexar, et cetera, et cetera. And right now, at this time of year, there's many different flavors of these cards. And of course, there's different sizes, but there's also different read-write speeds. You don't necessarily, unless you're doing video, you don't necessarily need the fastest card, which is going to be the most expensive one. Um, you can pick one that's in the middle of the range, and it will typically do a fabulous job on your DSLR. So one of the other things I wanted to mention that we probably should have put in here would be a card reader. Uh, I strongly encourage people to use a card reader rather than connecting the camera to the computer. If nothing else, it saves the battery, but it also saves wear and tear on the plug or the socket that's on the camera. And really can't replace that except at horrendous cost. So I would suggest that um, take a look around if you need a stocking stuffer. When everybody needs an extra memory card. Yeah, and can keep in mind that the um, the cards shown on the left here um, are a much more durable type of card than the consumer grade cards on the right. And interestingly, some of the most recent cameras, the 5D Mark III from Canon and the, and the D800 from Nikon, have a slot for each of these types of cards. And I'm far more willing to, to take my compact flash cards out and put them in a reader than I am my SD cards, because they're so thin and fragile that they delaminate easily. So what I tend to do is buy the biggest SD card available, put it in the camera, and leave it there. And that one I may actually read by cable for downloading. And then uh, if I'm going to be changing cards on site, I'm much more likely to change my compact flash cards, which are much more durable. Um, that, that's a more comfortable solution for me uh, in the field than, than changing these little thin, fragile SD cards. That's a good point. Next slide. Uh, the Ilford Gallery Gold Fiber Silk. Um, this is quite a paper. I put this on here because um, this is a paper, if you haven't tried it, you should. Uh, it's got a, it's somewhere between semi-gloss and semi-matte, whatever that means, but it's got real depth, great color rendering, 
Um, very, very professional looking. I used this recently to update my portfolio. In fact, I wrote an article which included some information about this for Photo Technique magazine, which was just published a couple of weeks ago. But the Beretta style papers, particularly the Ilford Gallery, this is quite a name, Gold Fiber Silk, um, it's really easy to profile. Um, I made a great profile of this with spider print, and it, it does a great job with both color and black and white. And it comes in a number of sizes too, it's not just 8 by 11. Oh, this one's me. This trigger trap is an ingenious system, and their latest tool is particularly ingenious. If you ignore the physical object in the photo on the left and look just at the dongles on the right, what you're seeing is a $10 camera cable and a $25 dongle. And if you buy them together, I think it's $30 for the pair. And then there's this application for your iPhone or your Android phone, which you use to communicate with this. So you're going to plug this into your camera, and you're going to now have the ability to use your phone to shoot photos with your camera. And this also takes the place of many of the other functions, time-lapse functions. It can even do... Um, increasing and decreasing time-lapse functions. It can do distance functions. I mean, you can use your phone's GPS to determine your speed and shoot photos not at an even time frame, but at an even distance. So even if you're slowing, up and, slowing down and speeding up in traffic, it will still take a shot at the same distance apart from the previous shots. So it's a great way to do all sorts of stuff that you never really thought of doing before. And it's uh, potentially going to replace some fairly expensive electronics for uh, time-lapse work. But this is how you're going to want to set a camera up. If you want to set a camera up for, let's say, wildlife shooting, if you, if you see an animal that's made a kill and it runs away when your Jeep arrives, you're going to stick your <laughs> camera, your second body, not your favorite body, onto one of these small tripods we've been showing you. You're going to put this rig on and you're going to climb back in the Jeep and back off, and when the animal returns to the kill, you now have a camera right up there that you can trigger remotely from your iPhone and uh, take shots with it. So there are all sorts of uses for this. I could go on for hours, but I think you're getting the idea. And the price compared to previous technologies for this type of thing is just absurd. We're talking about $30 buying you everything you need to do a remote triggering system and you know, short of tethered work in the studio, this is really the only kind of remote system you actually need to uh, run your camera because you already have your phone in your pocket, so everything else is covered. Okay, this is the um, relatively new, uh, I think it's earlier this year, the Sekonic touchscreen camera meter. Is This is the 478DR, which has the radio trigger for Pocket Wizard, etc. in it. But the thing that's really unique about it is not that it's digitized, digitized, et cetera, et cetera, but that it is a touch screen. And it does a number of very, very cool things, including adapting to the dynamic range of your camera. Um, you can use this for both. It has a lot of cinematic features in it, in addition to still photography. And I've got my sights on this one. I have an old Sekonic 358 that does about a third of what this one will do for me. And uh, I'm definitely going to be getting one of these in the near future. Well, David, I think you just blew the top off our price range. I thought that the, uh, the Batafly bag from Guru Gear was going to be the most expensive item on our list, but you've, uh, you've gone over the top. Well, yeah, over the top maybe, but this meter has been designed to be much, much less expensive than previous Sekonic models. So with the capabilities that this has, including the, the spot metering attachment, um, you'll probably spend around $200 less for this device than you would have spent on the older model Sekonic. So uh, I thought it was worth putting in. And there's no question it will fit in the stocking. It will fit in the stocking. So if you make photo books, you're probably familiar with Blurb. They're one of the leading bookmakers. and. We're simply pointing out here that this is 30% off through December 3rd that you get with Blurb now on uh, basically any book that you make, any purchase that you make. So, uh, so keep in mind if you're considering cranking out a photo book or two for the holidays that doing it now will cost you 30% less than doing it during the holiday rush. 
decides it might get them to where they're going in time is the other factor. Next. Okay, this is this is a whole data color kit. This is our new kit, and while it might not be our most expensive kit, it's the one that has the most components in it. So this is the best toy box that I can imagine giving a, a photographer for Christmas in terms of uh, all sorts of great gizmos for lens calibration, camera calibration, capture calibration, and of course there's our top end spider in there for display calibration, monitors, iPads, iPhones, TVs, you know, you can do anything with this with either the software that's in there or the free downloaded software for the iPad and the iPhone or with a software cross grade for a price you can do uh, video reference displays and TVs. So this is a cool kit and again it's pushing the, the upper end of the price limit. Uh, stocking stuffers. Um, I'll take this I'll take the Nick software David and then how about you take over with DxO. Um, Nick software in spite of all of the press that they've received lately is doing just fine. Um, all the technical and customer support things are still in place. And uh, one of my favorite software packages from Nick is SilverFX Pro. In fact, yesterday I was uh, editing some wedding pictures and converting them to black and white with SilverFX Pro 2, and they turned out to be really, really nice. I think the, uh, the bride and her husband are going to be thrilled with them. It's a, a fully featured program at a reasonable price. Uh, it can be added on to Lightroom or Photoshop. Um, and if you're not, if you're interested in black and white and you don't have this, I strongly encourage you to go and take a look at it. Uh, go ahead, David. Well, DxO is not a direct competitor to to, um, to NIC. They they have some overlap, but they're largely into um, optical tools, and they have their own RAW converter, which is uh, something that that NIC does not do as well. So there's a a range of DxO tools that are well worth looking at. And uh, both David Saffer and I are going to be working more with DxO in the coming year, I believe, and we'll probably be able to tell you more about the specific products that they offer after we've spent more time working with them. But it's, it's a very encouraging bundle of, of products that they're offering, and, uh, and we're looking forward to having the chance of testing the ones we haven't used and learning the ones that we have used better because they keep upgrading this stuff. They are the world's leading company for doing testing of lenses and putting out specs on uh, on what they do and how and they use that information in their own software to do lens correction and other uh, functions that are very very useful to the uh, photographer so I believe that may be the last one let's take a look indeed okay so, so um, go ahead <laughs> <laughs> that was an echo um, I wanted to thank you, David, and thank Datacolor for the opportunity to present today. We have a discount code for the people who are listening in to the webinar. It's holiday 20. It's valid through December 5th, so you can get a discount on Datacolor products on the website, on the Datacolor website. Uh, I wanted to mention that if the people have questions about technical issues uh, related to uh, color management or photography, you can reach me via email at dsaffer at mac.com. Uh, I will answer you. There are times where I get a lot of emails and an email will get past me. If you don't hear from me in 24 hours, just send it again and I'll get back to you and try to answer your question. Um, David, you want to take over for a moment? Well, sure. Holiday 20 is the uh, discount code you want here and you need to remember that it's all lower case and you can put that in for uh, discounts on any of the spider products within the next seven days. Now we should also have a winner from the people who have attended here. Christine and Duncan. There we go. So Christine Duncan you have just won a Spider 4 Pro and they will contact you at your email address to uh, figure out how you would like that shipped to you. So congratulations Christine. And thank you all for listening in. This webinar will be posted within a couple of days, whenever the, the video is made available to us, on the Datacolor website. And as I said, we should be putting up a PDF of this presentation for easy access to the URLs and the product names as well. So uh, we hope you've enjoyed this, and we hope you didn't drink too much eggnog while you were listening. And uh, we wish you all happy holidays. We'll see Have you Have a great month. holiday. See you next month.